All right, we're at Voodoo Gun Works, and we're going to talk about Precision 22 Long Rifle. And we're here with Andrew Workman. And uh, Andrew, why don't you just tell us what do you, what got you into 22 rimfire, and why do you love it? So honestly, the thing that got me into 22 rimfire is probably what got most people into 22 rimfire, especially recently with all of the uh, the growth in the NRL 22 and a lot of the rimfire precision matches that have popped up all over the country. Is I wanted to shoot center fire, and there was no place to go do it. Um, 22 was an obvious, uh, uh, I guess, um, what would you say, alternative. Uh, because you can do 22 on a much shorter range. A lot of ranges have the distances you know, for you to go shoot. Uh, it's easier to find places outside of city limits where you can you set up and shoot 22. When you're trying to shoot center fire, you're looking for lots of property, and that's hard for a lot of people to find. So I just naturally gravitated towards the, the rim fire um, game because it was something that was easy to put together. After I, uh, after I shot it for a while, I actually decided to start running uh, matches at our local club uh, for that reason, so that everybody had a place to come, you know, an outlet to come shoot a uh, precision rifle. So. Sweet. So, um, I mean, one thing on shooting like, uh, like center fire precision rifle, and I'm doing hand loads, I'm like really, you know, you're doing seating depths, every little grain of powder counts, and you find that, that harmonic sweet spot. Um, do you find that with a 22 precision rifle, like between different lots of, you know, say center X or whatever? Uh, I believe that uh, there is a lot of good ammunition on the market, for sure. And it seems as if each different barrel likes certain ammunition better than others. And it's, that's, there's no like, set in stone, hard, fast rules that you can apply. You literally have to buy a variety of things and go out and do some testing with your specific rifle to figure out what is it like the most. Um, a lot of it's done by shooting groups. A lot of it's done by using a chronograph. Uh, and once you find the ammunition that your barrel shoots better than, and we're talking you know, minuscule variants here, but you find something that shoots really good out of your gun, at that point you can start doing uh, more to increase your, your, your accuracy potential. You don't have the ability to load like you do in center fire, but people are doing all kinds of things like weighing the cartridges and measuring the rim thickness and just taking as many variables out of the equation as they possibly can just to make sure that they've got consistency in you know, every, every facet that they, they can control. <laughs> So. so people people are measuring each round and, and getting thicknesses of cases and yeah. wow. Yeah. And there's actually tools you can buy. You can go on, I think like Brownells or Midway, and there is a case rim tool to specifically measure how thick the, the rims are. Um, one of the things that's interesting about 22 ammunition is, for instance, I, I pulled apart um, uh, some very popular rimfire ammunition, match ammunition the other day, and was weighing the powder charge. Uh, it all came out to about one grain. We're talking like 1.06 grains. That's a tiny amount of powder. It doesn't even remotely come close to filling at the, the, the brass at all, which leads me to believe that a, you know, 40 to maybe 50% of uh, the velocity, the, the gases created in a 22 cartridge are actually ca uh, created by the primer compound. So I don't have any hard, fast data to back that up, but I, it was interesting to me that so little powder was actually in the case. So, um, so out of the voodoo or I mean, because that's what you're shooting. <laughs> right. yeah. um, is there any specific like bullet weight that tends to shoot better? Like they have like 45 grain, 40 grain, 38 grain. So in the industry, most of the match ammunition that you see is all going to be 40 grain. And I think that there's a few reasons. Uh, the stuff I just talked about with the, uh, the, the amount of powder that they're able to put in these uh, the priming compound and how uh, much gas that generates, um, I think is what is setting that, um, that bullet grain weight. Um, in match ammunition, 
we are always trying to stay just underneath supersonic. And there's a reason for that. Uh, supersonic 22 ammunition, even if it's coming out of the barrel at 1250 or 1300 feet per second, is already passing back through the transonic phase to subsonic by the time it hits about 60, 70 yards. So if you're trying to stretch out to the 200, 250 yard mark, you want to avoid the destabilizing effects of the transonic phase, and you just start your rounds subsonic to begin with. So when you take in, into account the amount of gas you're able to create in a 22 and what grain weight of bullet best creates that situation, pretty much across the board, the industry is settled on a 40 grain round for match ammunition. So for you, um, you've obviously tested a lot of ammo. A lot of ammo. <laughs> um, what have you found to be kind of like those consistent winners that are just, just tend to shoot better than others? So just like your top three is like, they win, generally. <laughs> so I will tell you right now, um, the most expensive ammo is not necessarily the most popular ammo in the Voodoo. Um, there is, uh, uh, I guess I have to back up to really answer your question, I have to back up a little bit and tell you that the Voodoo Chamber was designed around the Lapua family of rimfire match ammunition. So uh, for instance, Center X, which is their most popular, top of the line uh, match ammunition that you can get out there, is really what's meant to be fed through the Voodoo. Um, but that also means that all of the Lapua family is gonna run in the Voodoo flawlessly because that's what it was designed for, um, which includes Midas Plus, Exact, uh, all of the SK family. Some of the old Wolf match products were based on that same cartridge design, bullet shape, etc. cetera. Um, will the Voodoo's eat other stuff or feed other stuff, I guess is a better word? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we have a lot of customers that love to shoot Ely um, and it shoots wonderfully in the Voodoo's. Uh, if uh, customers want to shoot CCI Standard Plus or some of the, the Federal, Winchester, the stuff you would go into a store, a gun store and buy in bulk boxes, there's no reason that they can't feed through a Voodoo, but you may run into some issues with uh, heavy bolt clothes, with extraction problems, and it's not necessarily because the ammo is bad or the Voodoo isn't able to shoot it. They have different variances in the length and shape of their bullets, and the Voodoo wasn't specifically created to, uh, to feed those. So we suggest this is a fine firearm, you want to put the best ammunition, match ammunition you can through it to get the best results. So if I had to say, I would say probably Center X, the SK uh, match, which is uh, referred to by a lot of people as the red box, and SK uh, Standard Plus, which is the yellow box. And uh, oddly, even though that's the least expensive of the three, SK Standard Plus is probably the most popular ammunition that goes through the booze. So. It's a fantastic balance of quality and price. Gotcha, yeah, I, I remember this has got to be 20 years ago. My buddy used to shoot precision uh, 22 long rifle on it. I think it was just open sights, indoor stuff, sure. and he would shoot green tag. I don't know who makes that. I don't even know if it's, if it's made anymore, but that's the only one I knew back in the day. And it seems like there's got to be hundreds of precision 22 stuff out there. It's yeah, like, it really there's is. There's a ton of it. I think green tag's made by CCI. It's, uh, uh, we have a lot of customers that shoot it and it, 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 it'll shoot through the Voodoo great. There's no reason you couldn't use that, so. Cool, cool. cool. Um, so let's talk a little bit about barrel length. Like, you know, you can go 16, 18, 20, 22, whatever. Sure. Is there a specific barrel lengths that work better for precision rifle? So there's a lot of theories about barrel length out there. Um, the old uh, 40Xs, that existed. Um, a lot of those were in very long lengths. I, I can't even remember. I think it was like 26 inches. Um, uh, some of the, the older rimfire rifles came in those long lengths. A ben bench rest crowd wanted long lengths of barrels. But there is also a lot of theories. Uh, were they doing that just for, for uh, trying to get higher velocity? Like, not I don't know if they're trying to actually been the round more. I mean, one of the things about 22 is, is a one in 16 twist. That's the standard twist rate for all 
22 long rifle. Well, what that means is in a 16 inch barrel, that bullet's only getting twisted one time before it exits the muzzle, right? So if you go to a 26 inch barrel and suddenly the barrel has more ability to affect that and maybe make a more consistent twist after the bullet is gone, I don't necessarily have all the information to, you know, to be able to say one way or the other uh, if that's the case. But I will tell you that I'm lucky enough here in our shop to have a machinist sitting right here 10 feet from me. So uh, aside from all of the theories that are out there, I just started with a 26 inch blank and had my machinist start chopping it down one inch at a time. And I'd go out and I'd shoot a few thousand rounds through it, shoot it through the chrono, sh shoot groups on paper and, and look and see how that barrel actually performed. Um, by the time I hit 21 inches, uh, my velocity is completely changed. So at those longer lengths, I was barely able to get to about a thousand feet per second. We're talking like 985, 990, very slow. That goes to the theory that I was just talking about earlier, where if you have all of that metal, the bullet itself has burned up all the powder and is no longer creating velocity. And so the barrel at that point is now causing drag on the bullet and the bullet's slowing down. So when I hit that 21 inch mark, suddenly my velocities jumped up to published velocity, like 1075, 1085, where I expected it to be. From that 21 inch mark all the way back to 16 and a half inches, which is the shortest barrel that Voodoo makes, uh, velocity really didn't change much. So uh, then you just start to look at accuracy. Well, I'll tell you, I was really surprised. Barrel length didn't change my accuracy potential of the barrel at all. All of our Voodoo barrels shot absolutely fantastic. So all it came down to at that point was then velocity. So when customers call in and ask me what barrel should I use, I say it comes down to the velocity you're trying to get and the looks. It becomes a look thing. Uh, if, for instance, on this gun, this gun was specifically designed to be heavy. I use this for extreme long range shooting. I want it to be heavy, settle in on this bipod in the rear bag. I don't want any movement, uh, uh, minimize any tiny recoil that a 22 might have. And uh, so I went with our 20 inch barrel and an MTU profile specifically for that. Um, in uh, one of my other rifles, which I use for like NRL 22, um, I'm shooting positional stuff offhand, sometimes, you know, slung. Uh, that barrel's an 18 and it's fluted and it's a different profile and it's a lot lighter. So um, that, that's a really long path to get to the answer of your question. But um, I, when it comes down to, it, I think the sweet spot for voodoo barrels specifically is an 18 to 20 inch mark. That's where you're going to maximize the accuracy and velocity potential of the barrel. And it's coming down to looks because it's all pretty dang close. Yeah. Wow. So <laughs> I can't. You talk extreme long range. Extreme long range. With the 22. Yeah. Tell me about that. So. <laughs> what is extreme long range for that? So here's the, the, the funny thing about the Voodoo is a few years ago, before the Voodoo would really hit the market, if you were to ask anybody that shot a 22, what, what I mean, what's the limit for long 22 long rifle? Uh, they would have told you, oh, maybe 120 yards, 150 yards. Um, the Voodoo hit the market and guys started to actually try and stretch. Okay, well, you know, how far can we really shoot this thing? And so we had customers that were shooting 200, 250. Uh, we have uh, the folks, uh, good friends of ours, um, the Brozovich, uh, uh, the dad and son, Daniel and Jeff, um, they're up there in Montana and they really started to stretch the voodoos. They uh, had targets at 850 yards uh, the bullet at that point is coming in from the top, you know, because they're lobbing it in like this. And so they had to actually float targets out on a pond and, uh, and we're shooting at them basically from the top down. Um, but they were making impacts at 850 yards. So I don't think we even know what the potential of the 22 is yet. We're still, we're still in that experimentation phase where we're trying to find out what are these things even capable of. So because of all of this uh, kind of coming about because of the voodoo, in my opinion, um, ELR matches 
started to show up. Um, really similar to the centerfire matches that are out there, where they're shooting a 338 Lapua Magnum the, the, and, and the Shytax, and you've got King of Two Mile that's become really popular. Uh, where guys are doing that, they're stretching the envelope with their centerfire rifles. Well, the ELR game has also showed up for 22 as well. So ELR Central has started to keep track of world records. Um, and there have been a number of matches where you have to start at beyond 200, 250 yards. And these matches are pushing out 600 yards and farther. Um, and uh, you've got targets. The, the, the target size that is in the ELR Central rules is a 12 by 12 inch square. So at 600 yards, you're shooting a target about that big. And uh, that's a heck of a shot with, with the rimfire. With the rimfire. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. So as a 22 trainer for like PRS or the NRL matches, um, you know, if I'm shooting, let's say a 6.5 Creedmoor, I can take it out to 1300 or whatever consistently. Um, it's not very easy for people to do that. I mean, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> right. You know, right. I mean, even if we're, we're here we're in the West, it's like we can take a truck out and put steel as far as we want. But it's still you're an hour process of driving out, setting up steel, and then taking it down. And it's just a pain. It's true. Um, but so many people have access to two, three, four, five hundred yard ranges where it's just way more convenient. Um, but at those shorter ranges, is like a twenty-two, like a realistic trainer for somebody is training for PRS or other competitions. So absolutely, I think the twenty-two is a fantastic training platform, and honestly, that's why the Voodoo I think is so popular as a trainer. The Voodoo was specifically made to drop into any Remington 700 platform. It fits into chassis, just like this Jay Allen. It fits into any of the stocks that are inletted for Remington 700. So you can build a 22 that literally looks identical to your centerfire rifle in every way, which is great if you need something that you can take out conveniently to a short range and then practice your wind, practice your positional shooting, uh, practice building um, stable shooting platforms off of you know, tank traps and barricades and all of the other variety of things. You can go to your local range where you have maybe 200 yards um, and, and you know, spend a morning doing it as opposed to having to go out into the middle of nowhere and set up steel all day long and then practice with your larger rifle. Uh, th the great thing about 22 is that it's very easy with a simple ballistics app to replicate the kind of distances uh, that you're going to see with the center fire. Um, for instance, I know just off the top of my head because I shoot it all the time that my six Creedmoor uh, at a thousand yards I need to dial about 6.5 mils approximately. With my 22 that same dial is 200 yards. So I can replicate a thousand yard shot with my six Creedmoor with my 22 by placing a target at 200 yards and then shoot that all day long. The 22 obviously is traveling a lot slower, but that also means that wind is going to affect it more than a larger caliber uh, potentially would. Um, that's great for wind uh, management as well because that bullet's going to get pushed around inside 200 yards, much like a centerfire cartridge would downrange. Um, obviously, it's not exactly the same, but if what you're looking for is an economical training platform so that you can get out and actually get time pulling the trigger and building those positions, th there's just nothing better. I mean, you can go to a, the range on a weekend and easily blow 500 rounds through a Voodoo, where if you did that in a centerfire rifle, it would cost you a fortune and you'd have to spend all day long setting up to do it. So. It's all very similar. It's kind of like a paradigm shift, essentially. But like, yeah. if you were to train, be training for like a PRS match with your 22, like, what are some some drills or techniques or other things that you can do to to make that paradigm shift more realistic? I mean, you already kind of touched on it, but is there anything else to add? Well, uh, with the Voodoo's being so similar to your centerfire rifle, like I said before, you can build a Voodoo that looks exactly like your centerfire rifle in every way. Same chassis, same scope, same uh, trigger. Um, the only thing that changes is the, the cartridge that's being fired out of it. So um, I think all of the, the disciplines that you would apply to centerfire apply to training with your 22. Um, 
So squaring up behind the gun, natural point of aim, uh, controlling your breathing properly, uh, building your stable shooting uh, position, um, all the use of bags and bipods and, and tripods and all of the other gear that's available to us applies completely to rimfire just as it would with centerfire. I don't think you, I don't think you have to make any changes to your training regimen at all. And that's a great thing about it is that you can train literally for both using either. And uh, I don't think that really existed in the past because your 22 could never truly match your centerfire rifle. So. Hmm. Um, so, so getting maybe more to some of the engineering aspect of 22, like, is there any inherent uh, detriments to accuracy in 22, like how the round feeds or, you know, the chamberings, like how tight the chambers are, head spacing, any of that stuff? Is there anything like in the past or something that you found that, that helps? So one of the things that you'll hear us talk about with the Voodoo um, that other manufacturers have done, um, but uh, you don't find in your off-the-shelf uh, rifles, like you would go to the gun store, you know, the, the sub-$1,000 guns. I um, mean, this is something that our engineer, uh, Mr. Mike Bush, spent a lot of time developing so it worked properly, and that's called the, our control round feed. As uh, the bullet is pushed forward out of our magazine, uh, it actually pops up into the two extractors and they hold on to the cartridge while it feeds it directly into the chamber. Um, what that means is, is that bullet isn't going to ride along the edge of a chamber. It doesn't have a feed ramp. Uh, obviously, everybody knows that the, the 22 long rifle cartridge is just a you know, pressed formed lead uh, round and it doesn't have a copper jacket that's gonna help protect it and keep its shape and make sure it doesn't get scratched and marred and mushed around. And, and, and that, has, uh, that has caused problems with the, some of the 22s that are out there where they just feed up a feed ramp and push into the chamber. It's gonna scrape a big line down that lead and cause uh, you know, variation in its flight down range. Um, so the Voodoo is fully control round feed. Uh, the only way to get around that in the past uh, is to shoot a single shot where you know you didn't have a magazine the voodoo takes an AI footprint magazine um, that's it's it's our uh, probably pride and joy of the voodoo it's it's our patented uh, fully custom designed magazine uh, and it's part of the reason that the voodoo is able to be as accurate as it is um, some of the things some of the other things that make uh, 22 hard to engineer for I guess and things that we've spent a lot of time on is, uh, is the chamber. And uh, that's why I say it's really important for people to shoot match ammunition. This chamber was designed a little different than a centerfire chamber would be. In a centerfire chamber, if you were to jam that bullet into the lands right out of the, you know, as you close the bolt, you, you have crazy pressure spikes and, uh, and all kinds of other issues that come about in a big cartridge like that, you know, like a center fire would be. Uh, in 22, we jam that sucker right into the lands. If you feed with your fingers a 22 cartridge into our chamber, it stops with a millimeter or two of space left that you have to push the round into the chamber. What's happening is we're actually seeding that, that lead projectile into the lands so that we have control over how it engages into the rifling. So it's a little bit different than center fire in that way. So. Interesting. Well, that's cool. So yeah. the, that build next to you is really sweet. And it's one of your personal builds. Like, yeah. <laughs> tell me about that. Because, I mean, obviously, you're, you're working here. You can have whatever you want, right? right. Yeah. And so why did you choose what you did and for that build? And, like, show us that stuff. Well, to your point, um, I have the luxury of seeing a lot of different gear putting my hands on a lot of different gear. So if you know, I'm able to get my hands on it and try it out and touch it and feel it and use it, then obviously when I finally settle on a set of gear, it's, be, it's not because uh, uh, you know, oh, I just saw this or that's all I'm able to afford or whatever. It's because I've literally been able to choose from the best out there. And I actually have a couple of rifles and they don't all look like this. This rifle was very specifically built for long range, extreme long range. 
So this is a bench gun or a prone gun. It's nearly 20 pounds. Um, and, uh, and the pieces and parts that you see on it were chosen specifically for that task. I went with the heaviest barrel we've got. This is our MTU profile in a 20 inch. Um, it's our in-house ace barrel. Our ace barrels are made uh, for Voodoo specifically uh, by a small shop out of uh, Oregon State. And um, they uh, spend very, uh, it's not a, an assembly line kind of situation. These guys are spending time and attention very individually on every barrel they make for us. They're six groove, single point cut, hand lapped barrels. And uh, in my opinion, they're the best 22 rimfire barrels you can find on the market. So uh, in all of my guns, I use our ace barrels. But the 22 barrel, oddly, because it has such a, a much smaller hole that runs through it than a center fire rifle, is super heavy. So for instance, this 20 inch MTU 22 barrel weighs almost as much as my 24 inch six Creedmoor barrel. Um, even though it's so much shorter, because that, the, the bore is so much smaller, there's a lot of metal here that can you know, help create the weight that I want in a uh, you know, extreme long range gun. So the, uh, the, the scope I choose to use, some people have laughed at me when they see this on a 22. Because this is the Night Force 7 to 35 ATAC R uh, with the Mill C reticle. And they see this and they go, Isn't that a $3,600 scope? And you've got that on a 22? Are you out of your mind? There's a lot of reasons I picked this scope and the features it has. And of course, there's, a, there's other scope manufacturers making scopes that have these same features that would solve the same problems that I'm trying to solve with this. But I actually want the extremes of a big optic like this for 22 for a couple reasons. First of all, it's got parallax uh, that goes down well past 25 yards. 25 yards is, is a very common distance to shoot in some of our 22 uh, matches, like the NRL 22 or the Voodoo Rimfire series, which we run here. Um, you see quarter inch targets. Uh, and maybe even smaller in some of these matches. Um, and you have to be able to parallax your scope down to that 25 yard mark. Um, not only that, but it's a seven to 35 power scope. So if I'm shooting a center fire match and I've got targets out in the five to 900 yard range, I typically want more field of view. So I'm gonna be shooting out at the 12 to 18, maybe 22 power. Um, in this case, if I'm shooting matchstick heads at 25 yards, I want to be able to zoom in like a, you know, uh, like a telescope, basically. I want to be able to count the dimples on that match head um, because it's going to allow me to be more accurate on those tiny, tiny targets. So I want magnification, I want parallax, and then the last piece of this is I want a lot of travel. When you're doing ELR, extreme long range, we can be shooting to 600 yards plus with these 22s. So I have a 60 MOA base, and Voodoo offers their uh, bases in 20, 30, 40, and 60. But there's so much travel in this Night Force scope that even with a 60 MOA base, I'm still able to zero this gun at 25 yards. And it gives me about 31 and a half mils of full adjustment. That's not MOA, that's mils in my optic. That allows me to dial out past 500 yards uh, without any other kind of strange mechanical adjustment uh, ability on this gun. So uh, we also sell the Calvin Elite uh, by Timney. Um, and I, that's my trigger of choice. I usually have my triggers uh, for bench stuff set clear down at uh, eight ounces. Seems to be my sweet spot. Um, and I love the Calvin Elite because it's just a crisp, clean, fantastic trigger pull every single time. Uh, and then of course the Jay Allen is just one heck of a stock. The adjustments that you get here, the comfort that you feel while you're behind this, and then all of the uh, accessories you can get for this thing, such as the extended rail in front, which allows me to get a, a really forward position on my bipod, and then the bag rider in the back, and then the adjustable cheek piece. The Jay Allen's just fit all of my check boxes that I, I had for an extreme long range gun. So, like so this bipod is actually made by Atlas 
And uh, Voodoo sells a lot of Atlas bipods with their guns. They make a fantastic product. This one is kind of a blend of what you see in the tactical bipods that you, you, you would you know, normally see in like a PRS competition. And then an F-Class style bipod. I don't know if you've seen those, the big sled looking bipods. This is kind of a blend of those two things in that it gets you really wide helps you really get stable when you're you know uh, shooting prone at long distances so uh, you know I like this one because it's not a full-size F, F class bipod not you know two two feet wide and um, allows me to flip up the ends and put it in a bag and travel with it more conveniently seems to be kind of a, a good trade-off between the tactical bipod and a big bench rest bipod so that's a super sweet rig, man. Thank you. Uh, but you have another one sitting over here. Why don't you tell us about I that? I do. I'm really excited to show you guys this because this is, this is my, this is an ELR gun that was built for a very specific purpose. And uh, one moment, when it comes to my normal competition gun, this is actually what I'm shooting, and uh, this is probably pretty unique for a lot of people. Um, because you don't see a uh, stock that looks like this every day. This was um, the folks that uh, make uh, our action for us, Three Sigma, which is in Washington State, um, have helped us uh, basically in partnership with a group called All Composites, which is also there in Washington State, create uh, these carbon fiber stocks. These stocks are amazing in, in a couple of different ways. Um, first of all, they are uh, hand laid in a proprietary molding process um, that is uh, it's patented and it gives you a couple of controls over the carbon fiber that you don't see anywhere else in the industry. They are able to control the thickness of the carbon fiber in all of the different spots on this stock, anywhere from 50 thousandths of an inch all the way up to three quarters of an inch thick. What that gives you is the ability to control the strength and sti stiffness in specific areas of the stock, whereas uh, you know standard wood stocks, you're you're basically stuck with the material. Uh, fiberglass is the same way. Uh, building an aluminum chassis, uh, you have some of those kinds of controls, but this carbon fiber stock is literally a few ounces without all of the other things in it. It weighs absolutely nothing. So you're able to start with something that is very incredibly light and then tailor the weight and balance of the gun as you add pieces and parts onto it. Really, really cool technology. One other thing that's amazing about this stock is that the stock is actually made smaller than the action. And when you pull this action in with the action screws, it spreads apart and forms to the action. So you don't need any bedding or anything like that with this stock. It literally is made, that's a patented uh, technology they use for uh, their rifle stocks. And it, it's as good and repeatable as any bedding that you could do to the stock. And it just literally just bolts down. So, but this gun specifically, I have designed for doing like NRL 22, Voodoo Rimfire series, uh, non extreme, you know, long range kind of matches. The whole gun weighs about 12 pounds, as you see it, even with the big Night Force scope on it. I've got an 18 inch Kukri Ace Barrel, Voodoo Barrel, um, and uh, it, it's got that same Timney trigger, which I love, the Calvin Elite set at about eight ounces. It's got all the, the adjustability that you could want, length of pull, cheek riser, um, and then uh, it, I like to run suppressed uh, with this particular um, rifle. Uh, it makes shooting this thing an absolute pleasure, pleasure. and uh, it's just it is probably my favorite rifle I've ever owned. Not only that, but it looks awesome. Um, so, how about cleaning? Like, what type of uh, cleaning regimen? I mean, I hate cleaning rifles. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I just I shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot, and if you know if I start losing accuracy or whatever, then maybe I'll clean it. But what is recommended, or when do you start seeing some fall off on? So 22, just because it doesn't generate uh, the kinds of pressures that centerfire does, the kind of heat that centerfire does, 
uh, it is inherently dirty. It doesn't burn up all the powder all the time. It leaves carbon residue. It, and if you've ever shot a suppressor on a 22, you know what I'm talking about. A suppressor will fill up with all of that junk that doesn't get burned up. And uh, you have to clean your suppressors after, you know, a uh, you know, thousand rounds or so um, because they just start to, you know, cause flyers and all kinds of other problems. So a couple of the things to pay attention to when you're, um, when you're cleaning a 22. The 22 will get a carbon ring that builds up right at the mouth of the chamber, not the mouth of the chamber, but right at the end of the chamber where uh, that bullet start, seats into the lands, right where the rifling start. You'll get a carbon ring that builds right there. And if it gets big enough, which it eventually will over a few thousand rounds, it'll start to compress the lead of your round as it goes into the chamber and it will cause accuracy to, to really fall off. So you need to pay attention to that in your cleaning regimen. And then you also need uh, to make sure that you're, you're getting all of that crap out of the barrel whenever uh, you know, you're done with your, your shooting for the day. I recommend people just run a patch or a bore snake at the end of the day through their gun. Um, but what we do recommend is that if your accuracy starts to really degrade, we do have a cleaning regimen that you can find on our uh, website. It's on YouTube, and it details the, the whole cleaning process uh, for your gun. Now, one of the questions I get asked all the time that relates to cleaning, I guess, in, in certain ways, is how do I break in my 22? And uh, what we tell people here is shoot a couple of hundred rounds through it, maybe two boxes. And uh, what that's going to do is any tiny microscopic machining marks or burrs or anything that happen to, to be still in the barrel from the machining process are going to get wore out by those for a few hundred rounds. Then run a few patches through it and shoot it. That's it. There's no real crazy break-in process that you need to go through like you would maybe with a centerfire barrel. Um, we don't know how many rounds you can put through a voodoo barrel. I have on my two rifles over 20,000 rounds through them, and they're not even remotely close to being shot out. It just simply, again, doesn't generate the pressures and heat that a centerfire barrel would, so you're not going to shoot them out uh, in, in a short life of maybe 2,000 rounds or 2,500 rounds like you would a 6.5 Creedmoor. Um, so what we tell people is shoot them, run a patch after you're done at the range that day, and just keep shooting them. When you do see accuracy fall off, that's when you go ahead and do a big, heavy, full cleaning. Shoot a, a, a you know, box of 50 back through your barrel to re-season it, and you're good to go again. Um, so what do, you, what do you think the future is in 22? Because, I mean, it seems like just in the last year or so, it's really gotten popular. So when I see that, that, that tells me the innovation is just starting. You know just what I mean? Starting. Yeah. I really believe that's the case. Um, and I will tell you that because suddenly the envelope is being pushed uh, in, in the matches that are being run, in the technology that's being built into these guns, um, ammunition has been scrambling a little bit to try and catch back up because we've reached the, the accuracy potential of the ammunition on the market, in my opinion. Um, as we pushed out past about 400 yards, we started to see the, uh, the ES or the extreme spread of the velocity of the ammunition and the standard deviation in that velocity uh, open up our groups to the point where it's larger than the targets we're shooting at. When that happens, you've got to do one of two things, change something in the gun or change the ammunition. 22 is hard for us to change anything that involves ammunition because we don't have control over it, the manufacturers do. So uh, I will tell you that we have been in, in discussion with manufacturers of a lot of the match ammo, and they're very interested in, in pushing this envelope with us and creating ammunition will allow us to shoot this further. So it's exciting um, because like you said, it's, this, is just, this is just the beginning of this. Um, the 22 market, even though the 22 is one of the, the most established, um, uh, you know, cartridges on the planet, and there's probably more of them out there than any other firearm in history, L literally, this is brand new. 
for the 22. It's never been pushed like this. It's never been capable of doing the things we're doing with it right now. So this is a completely new world we're in. It's exciting. That's great. Um, so just kind of wrapping this up, I, uh, you know, we got, there's a lot of people out there looking to get into competition or just really getting in and pushing their limits and, and training. Yeah. Um, what, what advice do you have for somebody that's looking to get into it? Not, not necessarily a voodoo, but just, just getting into the Precision 22 game and getting into matches. So the first thing I always tell people that ask me this very question is before you buy anything, before you waste money on any gear, before you go look at guns, find a local match close to you and go. And just show up. Don't show up with anything. Don't expect to be there to compete. Just show up and ask questions and introduce yourself. And uh, I guarantee you the people that you will meet there will take care of you. It's a amazing community of folks that are in the competition scene and they're very willing to help. They're really excited about bringing new people into the sport. And so what you're gonna get when you get there is probably a fire hose of information, firstly. Um, so take a notepad or something. Um, but you're also uh, going to see a lot of variety of equipment. And, uh, and then you can start making some decisions about what it is that you want to use for yourself. Um, but I think the best thing you can do is get out there and start talking to people. Um, most likely what you'll find is they'll have you plop down behind their, one of their guns right there on the spot and give it a test drive. Um, most people are absolutely willing to do that. I know here at our match, I always pack an extra gun in case somebody walks up and says, hey, this looks really cool, you know, uh, how do I get into this? And I'm like, here, come over, lay on my mat, here's some ammo, here's a rifle, shoot. Um, and uh, a lot of those people then get into the sport with us and actually show up and start coming every month to the matches. Um, so yeah, th that's my first suggestion to people. Secondly, um, it does not have to be an arms race. The voodoos are the top of the game when it comes to the, the accuracy and the quality of their builds, but they're also the top of the game when it comes to the expense, for good reason. They're, this is a fine handcrafted firearm. Um, does that mean that you have to have this to be competitive? Absolutely not. We have folks coming out that buy 10 22s and throw a, a little you know, uh, cheap scope on it, and they come out and have a great time. Um, are they gonna be as accurate as the voodoos? No, but that doesn't mean those folks can't come out and get their feet wet and start getting experience and, uh, and, and actually, you know, getting part into the community, becoming part of the, the shooting community. And then as you grow into it, then you can upgrade. So I say start shooting, you know, go down and buy a CZ 455, go buy a, a Ruger 1022. Those are fantastic rifles and, and uh, with a little bit of upgrade and a good optic, you can come out and be just as competitive as anybody else. Um, but yeah, absolutely, I think the first step is just go out and, and introduce yourself and get involved, so. Awesome. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for talking with us. I'm sure. Hopefully it's helped everybody that's watching this now. And uh, so yeah, if you guys uh, have any interest in 22, check out Voodoo Gunworks. Uh, they do some really good work and just want to thank them again. And if you're getting any value out of what you're seeing, go ahead and subscribe and uh, stay, you know, stay safe, have fun, and I'll see you at the range.